Welcome to Up Close, the research, opinion and analysis podcast from the University of Melbourne, Australia. I'm Shane Huntington. Thanks for joining us. The human brain is the most complex organic computer ever seen in nature. Despite extraordinary advances in medicine and biochemistry over the last century, there remain many conditions of the brain for which we have minimal understanding. Additionally, concepts we take for granted on a daily basis, such as consciousness, dreams, imaginative ability and memory, remain elusive. To explore the brain's workings, computational neurobiology combines computer modelling with experimental biology to study its complexity. To tell us more about computational neurobiology, we are joined by Professor Terry Sainofsky, head of the Computational Neurobiology Laboratory and Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, La Jolla, San Diego, California. Professor Sanofsky is visiting the University of Melbourne as a guest of the ICT for Life Sciences Forum 2011. Terry also delivered the 2011 Graham Clark Oration while in Melbourne. Welcome to Up Close, Terry. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with uh, just a bit of a discussion on how computer models actually help us understand the human brain. Well, neuroscientists who study the brain are very good at taking it apart into pieces. We have almost complete parts list of the different molecules that uh, neurons use to communicate with each other, for example, at synapses. But in order to understand the function of a complex system like the neural networks that uh, interact with each other to produce perception and, and our understanding of the world, we need to take those parts and put them back together again. And this synthetic enterprise is best done inside a computer, which will allow us to explore all those interactions in a way that will give us some deeper understanding. And we do that in two different ways. We do that first by simulating the actual processing going on and compare that with experiments so we can make predictions for experiments. But interestingly, what emerges from that, and this is something that's been very successful in physics, are general principles for the function of a neural circuit. And those general principles can be instantiated outside of the brain and helps us make devices that uh, the public can use. When you consider the processes that are involved in the brain, what sort of level are we looking at with this computer modeling? Is it brain as a whole or the individual sort of molecular processes? Where exactly are you focusing the attention? Well, when you look inside the brain, you find structure at every spatial scale, ranging from the molecular all the way up to the entire central nervous system. And that covers eight orders of magnitude of spatial scale. And each of those scales represents a different architecture. Uh, if you look at, for example, the interactions between neurons in a small little piece of uh, the cortex, cerebral cortex, that is on the outside of the brain that provides us with a very large memory store and the ability to think and to reason, those neurons are interacting with each other in a very, very tight network, which represents recurrent connections within the network and uh, we know is very important for storing the information. However, if you look at two distant parts of the cortex, the connections between them are very sparse. So uh, on a global scale, the connections are very expensive, and therefore only a few neurons can be connected over a long distance. And then as you get closer, uh, less than a millimeter, the connection strengths start increasing, and then it becomes a very tight interacting network. And that has a very, very interesting structure because it means that you have uh, local computation, long distance communication, and ultimately, in order for the whole brain to work together in an integrated way, there has to be some way of for different parts of the brain to sort of synchronize with each other. Presumably, these different sort of scales and types of functions that you have in the brain are modeled in, in different ways. I mean, is this a significant challenge for the, the computational modeling aspect of the project where one model may work for one scale but not for another? Exactly. It's a multi-scale problem, and you need different types of models at different levels. So, for example, at the level of molecules, we are trying to understand how the different parts of, say, a synapse, that uh, place where two neurons interact with each other, we're trying to understand the conditions under which one neuron 
will release neurotransmitter and then uh, diffuses over to the postsynaptic side, receiving side, and then interacts there with the receptors. Now, that process is uh, governed by equations that uh, are responsible for the diffusion of molecules. This goes back to Brownian motion and Einstein's discovery of the actual molecular size of matter. And, uh, and it's interesting that those insights now we know are, are driving brain communication. Diffusion is an important part of chemical signaling. But we can simulate that using Monte Carlo techniques in physics. And that way we can match the actual communication that is observed by neuroscientists recording from those two neurons. We could match that with the actual chemical interactions that are occurring between the molecules. And Monte Carlo techniques are, are used for modeling mini body problems. Oh, yes. This was a technique that was developed during World War II by Stan Ulam and others who were trying to calculate the diffusion of neutrons. And that was important for calculating the critical mass for uh, uranium 235 to create a, uh, a nuclear fission reaction, chain reaction. They realized that. Sometimes the equations uh, cannot be solved analytically, but what you can do is to track every single neutron in a distributional way. You don't actually have to track it all the way as it's wiggling around, but it, what you do is you jump from one place to the next with the same distance that roughly it would take uh, that much time, and it gives you the same uh, average results. It's an approximation, but it's a very good one, and interestingly, it's very important in the brain because of the fact there are relatively few molecules that are used for signaling, typically in the order of a few thousand neurotransmitter molecules. The actual uh, molecules, for example, the receptors on the postsynaptic side, 10 to 100. So we're not talking here about macroscopic numbers. We're talking about relatively small numbers of molecules. And that illustrates that nature has reached the point where it's calculating with small molecules. It's very, very efficient, energy efficient, and it's uh, extremely powerful in terms of the number of computations that can be done, far exceeding all of the combined computational power of all the computers on the planet. Terry, in previous episodes of Up Close, we've often focused on the biological elements of the brain and, and neural conditions. Uh, in episode 105, we spoke about multiple sclerosis. In episode 118, we spoke about myelination. How does the computational work that you're doing interact with the biologists? Well, it's interesting that you bring up multiple sclerosis and myelination because I was recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and the proceedings of the National Academy allow new members to uh, submit and contribute inaugural article. And the one that uh, my lab contributed was a computer model of uh, demyelination. And multiple sclerosis is an extremely debilitating disease. It's progressive, and uh, it involves the unraveling of the myelin sheath that uh, neurons use to help the action potential communicate down the axon. And uh, if too much myelin is lost, then uh, conduction can be blocked. And of course, that in the sensory area will produce you know, your inability to feel or touch. And if it was the optic nerve, uh, it will produce blindness. But paradoxically, in some cases, it also produces acute pain. That is to say, activity where there shouldn't be activity, action potentials being generated spontaneously. Well, in developing models for the uh, axonal transmission, we went back to Hodgkin and Huxley, who are two physiologists who studied the squid axon. And what we did is we added myelin to their model. And myelin, what it does is it basically uh, separates the regions where the um, ion channels are located. So the signal jumps from one node to the next. And so what we showed was that if you demyelinate the axon, we could reproduce all of the phenomenological observations. And we discovered by varying the parameters in the model that there was one very important parameter, which is the ratio of the sodium current that was responsible for the very fast influx of sodium and the, uh, the peak of the action potential. And another ion current that had been ignored, it had been ignored because it's in the background of all neurons. It's not voltage sensitive. It's called the potassium leak conductance. And it sets the input resistance. So it turns out that the ratio of the sodium conductance and the potassium leak conductance, that ratio is kept in normal 
axons within a narrow range. And if it's too high, if there's too much excitability, then you get spontaneous activity. If it's too low, you get conduction block. And so what we're able to do is now make a very strong prediction. We predict that if you can regulate that leak potassium conductance, and it's a family of ion channels that are genetically coded, the KC and K family, that if you could target those channels and either block them or enhance them, that it should be possible to provide relief for MS patients who are suffering these symptoms. And of course, this is something that now the drug companies, we were very good at being able to target drugs for specific receptors in ion channels that they could now work with. And it's, it's an idea that no one had thought of before. And it's a, a very promising avenue, I think, that we can take. Again, illustrating how computer models can help you understand the basic phenomenon. And then once you have that, come up with some new suggestions that are, you can go back to the lab and test. Now, Terry, just to clarify that, what you're achieving there with drugs is similar to making sure the impedance of a person's speakers in their stereo is matched to what their amplifier is putting out. Well, that's a good analogy. In other words, there's a dynamic range for every process in the brain, and if it gets too high or too low, you could uh, disrupt the function of that channel, the information channel. The idea of a ratio was basically you have an excitable component, the sodium channel, and you have the potassium current, which basically uh, sets the baseline. So the two working together, interacting with each other, is the ratio. They could both be high and low. That's fine as long as the ratio is the same. This is Up Close, coming to you from the University of Melbourne, Australia. I'm Shane Huntington. Our guest today is Professor Terry Sanofsky, and we're talking about aspects of computational neurobiology. Terry, there are many complex systems that we model using these sorts of techniques. Does the brain compare to any of them? Is it more complex than all of them, or is it comparable to things like global weather? Well, Nature is complex at every different spatial scale. So if you are trying to understand, for example, a single neuron, a neuron is a cell and has roughly the same components of every cell in your body. It has some specialized ion channels, but basically it has to create energy, ATP. It has mitochondrion to do that. It has the complete set of metabolic pathways that... uh, create ATP from glucose. And so it, in a sense, is like a little city with an economy. And that economy internally is maintained by thousands of different enzymes and different uh, cell biological mechanisms. It turns out very, very uh, complex in terms of all their interactions. And one of the exciting areas right now of biology is called systems biology. And systems biologists are trying to create models of all those interactions and understand something about the way that the cell responds to signals from the outside, the way that it can change the internal genetic expression of the different genes in in response to those signals. And interestingly, as they write down their equations for those interactions, lo and behold, they are the same equations that we worked with 20 years ago when we were first writing down simple models of neurons. Namely, you have uh, interactions occurring. Those are like chemical interactions. You have uh, activation functions that look like sigmoids, and that's like the firing rate of the neuron. And so, uh, interestingly, the same mathematics, a lot of the same conceptual framework that we developed back in the 1980s and 90s really is uh, very applicable today to the work that the systems biologists are doing just to model a single cell. It's really an interesting situation here where we can sort of think that nature has discovered ways of organizing very complex systems, and it's using similar approaches at different levels of complexity. Now, the biologists, when they consider these issues around the brain and and other parts of the body, will first look at simpler creatures, uh, often uh, something like a mouse model or, or other Um, alternatives to looking at humans directly. What's the comparator in computational neurobiology? Well, I think that it made a lot of sense to try to first understand creatures that have uh, many fewer neurons than ours. We have about 100 billion neurons. And so if you can study, say, a bee, honeybee, that only has a million neurons, it might be possible to make progress. And indeed, uh, it has been. However, what we've discovered along the way is that nature, in having to work with fewer and fewer neurons, has made each one of them more and more specialized. So in a sense, a single neuron in the bee brain has to accomplish what in our brain may take thousands of neurons. 
it helps because it focuses you on a specific function of a specific neuron. But also what it means is that you really have to really dive down deeply into every single part of the neuron that the different branches, for example, of the dendritic tree of a single neuron could be doing different things. And uh, we come to appreciate is that the so-called simple brains turn out to be even more complex than ours with respect to their degree of miniaturization and specialization. You mentioned uh, before the work you've been doing on MS. Are there other conditions that you've also been studying with these techniques for which uh, we know there are ongoing struggles with for many people in the world? One of the most very uh, debilitating uh, mental disorders are ones that involve changes in the way we think, especially uh, one out of every 100 babies is born with the potential to become schizophrenic. And schizophrenia is very, very pernicious. It doesn't manifest until late adolescence, early adulthood. It's just at a time when someone is uh, becoming an adult, they can uh, be very much affected in terms of both their own thinking patterns, uh, becoming um, bizarre hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, uh, cognitive problems, but also the impact that has on their families and on society that has to support people who are no longer capable of really uh, making decisions on their own. This is, I think, an area where we can make some progress. And, and the reason is that unlike Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases where the neurons are dying and cannot be resurrected, in the case of schizophrenics, the neurons don't die, they just malfunction. And we need to find out, first of all, at what point during development does that occur? And uh, number two, which neurons are involved? And number three, how can we go in and understand the impact that those alterations have on the function of the neural circuit? And then what impact does that have on your ability to think and perceive? And we've made progress on all of those. Just within the last few years, we've identified a particular type of neuron called a fast-spiking parvalbumin positive interneuron called the basket cell, which is very important for feedback inhibition in the cortical circuit. And uh, these neurons constitute about 5% of all the neurons in your cortex. And we have a mouse model where we're, we're able to show that uh, we can produce similar behavioral deficits in mice by uh, injecting a particular drug that's a street drug that's used by kids when they're partying. It's, it's called uh, Special K or ketamine. And if you uh, deliver that just twice on two successive days at sub-anesthetic doses, it's used in veterinary medicine as an anesthetic, but with the smaller doses, it produces hallucinations and out-of-body experiences, and, which is presumably what the kids who are taking it are experiencing. But they often, after a party weekend, will come into the emergency room with schizophrenic symptoms, a psychotic episodes that are identical to what are seen in schizophrenics. But fortunately, th that will resolve in a few days, uh, and so it's reversible. But the fact that you can produce similar thought disorders is an indication that uh, we're on the right track, and we've reproduced that in the mouse, and we've identified this particular type of interneuron, and now the question is, what's happening? Well, what's happening is very, very intriguing. There's a gene in that neuron that produces the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, and this is released from the nerve terminal, and it inhibits the postsynaptic neuron, and specifically the pyramidal cells that are producing the spikes that travel a long distance. Now, if you knock out the enzyme that produces GABA, the neuron can no longer inhibit the pyramidal cell, and that means that you've changed the balance of excitation inhibition. And once you've changed the balance, the circuit is no longer working the way it normally would. And so now we can go in and say, well, why is it that gene being turned off? And we've just recently done some experiments. Uh, Marga Behrens, who's a staff scientist in my lab, has discovered that it may be a methylation mark on that gene. Methylation is an epigenomic way of regulating genes. It's known that during early in development, when a neuron is being specialized down a certain track, that certain genes will be turned on and others will be turned off permanently. And that's done with methylating the DNA. And it looks as if in these neurons, early in development, there's an event, perhaps an infection, perhaps something that disrupts the biochemical machinery 
that makes the neuron go down a path which makes that gene that gets methylated ineffective and unable then to produce a neuron that is able to uh, integrate into the circuit. Now, why is it that it takes so long for that to manifest itself is still a mystery, but we do know that if you do deliver this drug, ketamine, not as an adult, but rather in the first or second week of uh, postnatal life of the mouse, that you can permanently disable 40% of the basket cells that are responsible for this circuit, this inhibitory circuit. So I think we're now beginning to understand a little bit more about the genetic and the molecular mechanisms that could be the very first steps that are involved in making a brain susceptible to a schizophrenic state. And now our task is to go and try to f prove that, number one, and number two, to find out how we can reverse some of those changes. And I think because of the fact that the neurons are still alive, it might be possible to rescue them. I'm Shane Huntington, and my guest today is Professor Terry Senovsky. We're talking about a range of aspects of computational biology here on Up Close, coming to you from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Terry, we've been talking about um, your studies of the human brain. I was thinking we would now turn that around and talk a little bit about how the brain is teaching us more about computers and computational systems. What are we learning from the way the brain operates? One of the big challenges right now in computer science is how to harness a large number of processors. Uh, the traditional way that you program a computer is by writing a program that does one step at a time. Now, that's fine if you have one processor, but what if you have 100 or 1,000 or 100,000? And how do you take a problem, for example, recognizing an object in an image, and distribute it over thousands of processors so that uh, each one is doing a little part of the problem? Well, that's how the brain works. The brain has hundreds of billions of neurons, and these are interacting together uh, very tightly in these neural networks. And by going and looking at the architecture of the brain, what's the connectivity pattern? What are the signals? How is the uh, information about a particular part of an object distributed over hundreds and thousands of neurons? That's giving us insights and principles that may allow us then to go back and design better computers to program those large parallel machines that we are now are manufacturing and allow them to be able to perceive and see in the same way that we do. Now, it's going to be with a very different material, right? These chips are made out of silicon, but it's the principle that we're trying to extract from the brain and then program into those chips. Many of our listeners, of course, will have heard of artificial intelligence, but one of the areas of interest in this area is what's called machine learning. Can you give us an idea of what is meant by that term? Yeah, so the early days of uh, artificial intelligence, going back to the 1950s, the hope was that you could engineer an intelligent system just by writing a program. That meant you had to have complete knowledge of the domain that you were trying to understand. You needed to be able to define exactly what are the rules that you have to follow in order to be able to, say, recognize an object like a cup. Now, the problem turned out to be much more difficult than anybody imagined. And the reason is that cups come in many different sizes and shapes, and you can look at it from the top and the bottom and the side. And in order to write down all the rules to recognize all the cups would take your whole lifetime. And that's just one object. So it's clear that it's very inefficient to use these rules that have to be handcrafted for every particular problem that you have to solve. There are some simple problems where you could do that. Uh, and a good example of that is playing chess, where the rules are very well defined and, and just a matter of going through and uh, testing all the different moves that could be made. And that's a brute force way to solve the problem. But the brain solves it in a very much more interesting way. The brain uses pattern recognition. The brain is able to look and to very rapidly come up with a probability for what the object is. And it does that through learning. And that turns out to be the really the key component of intelligence that wasn't appreciated early on. And by learning, I mean learning from examples through experience. You've experienced hundreds, thousands of cups in your lifetime. And all those examples are then encoded in your brain and used to predict the next time you see something in that category. And even if you can't define what a cup is, you sort of know it when you see it. And that's really what uh, we've developed over the last 20 years is uh, more and more algorithms that are uh, able to handle very, very large data sets, 
very high dimensional spaces with many different features and very efficiently to go through and sort and be able to take those examples and then to be able to generalize from them. And that's a, a field that is really exploding in the last five or 10 years, primarily because of the internet, because of the fact that there are so many images out on the internet. There are so many different data sets that become available. For example, uh, faces. Uh, faces are very important for uh, social communication, for being able to recognize people. But up until recently, we didn't have very efficient ways for, first of all, identifying where the faces are located in the photograph, and then even after that, come up with some estimate for what are the facial expressions, how old is the person. That problem has been solved. That's a solved problem in machine learning. We have very efficient algorithms. We can pick out all the faces. One of my former students, Marnie Stewart Bartlett, has uh, written a program that is capable of recognizing in real time changing facial expressions. And that means a computer now can recognize whether you're happy or sad, surprised, angry, or disgusted. Terry, when humans make decisions, a big part of that, of course, is this sort of data that we store over time in our learning, but another part of it is our emotional state. How do we go about addressing that particular sort of capacity that we have when we're trying to get computers to do the same sort of thing? Emotions, I think, have had a really interesting history, both in terms of psychology and also in terms of robotics and machine learning. So the belief was that intelligence was all about cognition, about thinking and deducing uh, consequences. Well, uh, somewhere along the way, that has shifted. And now we are beginning to appreciate that a large part of intelligence is not deduction, but induction. And by that, I mean, how do you develop a system that can assign probabilities to different outcomes? And that's, of course, what learning is all about, is experiencing the different outcomes and finding out under which context each one of them may happen. And I think that emotions are an indication of your internal state that is uh, responding to the challenges of the outside world. And it's a very important part of intelligence to be able to have the right uh, stance. So uh, if you're in a dangerous situation, you want to be alert. If you're in a friendly situation, you want to be open. And if you're surprised, uh, you need to be able to communicate that to the other people around you, because otherwise they're not going to be able to interpret your actions. So this is a very interesting um, part of the brain that is involved in, in creating emotions and emotional expressions on the face for communication. And uh, we're beginning to model those. It's possible to go in and look at these neuromodulatory systems. And dopamine, for example, the reward system is a very powerful one that is involved in motivation. And it's powered by positive experiences like uh, food, having a good dinner, friends, sex. And that then changes the probabilities with which you'll do things in the future. So this is a very interesting part of the, the mystery of you know, who we are, trying to understand how the emotions fit into our thinking and affect our uh, decisions. Terry, just to finish up, how close are we to getting a computer that essentially mimics the human brain? Is that going to ever happen? Well, I think that we all have this image of a robot that walks around and talks and acts like a human. And I think that, to some extent, that will happen. But I don't think that it will necessarily take the path that humans have. That is to say, the machines that we're developing, they're going to get embedded into the woodwork. In other words, we'll be interacting with machines. We do all the time. You know, you pick up your iPhone and you dial into something and, and you're getting information back and forth. Well, at some point, your iPhone is going to become intelligent. It will be a social robot. It will recognize you. <laughs> and all the appliances that we have will become intelligent appliances. And it's not just things that we interact with. It will be things like the radar systems that the uh, military use, power systems that regulate electricity flow throughout the world. That's all going to become much more sophisticated, energy efficient, and it will be run on the same algorithms that your brain has used. Professor Terry Sanofsky, thank you very much for being our guest on Up Close today and giving us such a great understanding of uh, some of the things going on in computational neurobiology. Well, thank you very much. This is, was in a very exciting uh, era that we're living through, and I'm really pleased to be here. That was Professor Terry Sanofsky, head of the Computational Neurobiology Laboratory and Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, La Jolla, San Diego, California.
This episode of Up Close was supported by the Melbourne Festival of Ideas 2011. For more information about the festival, visit ideas.unimelb.edu.au. Relevant links, a full transcript and more info on this episode can be found on our website at upclose.unimelb.edu.au. Up Close is a production of the University of Melbourne, Australia. This episode was recorded on Thursday the 10th of March 2011. Our producers for this episode were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel. Audio engineering by Gavin Neighbour. Background research by Diani Lewis. Up Close is created by Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham. I'm Shane Huntington. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Up Close. For more information, visit upclose.unimelb.edu.au. Copyright 2011, the University of Melbourne.